Right on time, six o'clock, all right. We'll get rolling here. Um, my name is uh, Steve Hotchberg, I'm Chief Market Analyst at Elliott Wave International. Uh, I work closely with Bob Prechter I've, since the early 1990s. Um, Bob started the company back in the late 70s. He writes a financial newsletter called the Elliott Wave Theorist, and he also writes a lot of theoretical material. He just came out with a brand new book called The Socionomic, Socionomic Theory of Finance, which is a very fascinating book about some of the uh, ideas that he has and that we share at Elliott Wave International about uh, how markets behave, how people behave, and that's really what um, we look at at Elliott Wave International. I write a monthly newsletter called the Elliott Wave Financial Forecast with my partner, Peter Kendall. I also put out a three-time-a-week hotline or update Monday, Wednesday, and Friday after the market closes, kind of as a bridge between each issue of the newsletter. So if you've seen my workshops before, you know I have a ton of overheads, and the reason I have overheads and slides is, number one, I'm a market technician, so we're going to look at actually what happened in the market, and plus I'm going to give you my opinion, and you need some evidence and these overheads and these charts are evidence to back up what, what I'm saying. So I want to start out uh, by asking a simple question. Why do stocks rise and why do they fall? Why do they go up and why do they go down? More people buying than selling. More people buying than selling is one answer. Um, people give you a lot of different answers on why stocks go up and down. This Bloomberg article gave us one of the reasons that this writer thinks stocks go up and down. And this is a chart of Weight Watchers on the left, all right? And uh, as you know, the Oprah Winfrey uh, announced that she's using Weight Watchers. And she recently announced on December 22nd that Weight Watchers rallies on news that Oprah lost 40 pounds, okay? So, and that's, that's this little arrow right here. Let me put a pointer on this. So this writer obviously is insinuating that the stock of Weight Watchers is going to go up and down with Oprah's weight, which is, which is kind of a funny thing because, God forbid, somebody like TMZ snaps are coming out of a Domino's, stock's going to crash. But in reality, stocks go up for one reason and one reason only, and they go down for one reason and one reason only. And, and, and when I'm saying stocks, I mean in the aggregate. And that is because people think they're going to make money. When they buy a stock, they think the price is going to go up, right, and they're going to get rich. Right? Everything else is a rationalization of what really is an emotional-based decision. Okay? And that's what we do at LA Wave International. We, we st strip away all the rationalizations, whether a CEO is magnanimous or whether the earnings are going to go up or whether the economy is going to improve. And what we try to do is get down to the most basic element of why people invest. And it's an emotional-based decision, and the reason they invest is because they think they're going to make money. They think they're going to get rich. Okay? So what we do is well, let's take a look at stocks, and I want to start by looking at the model. What is Elliott? We're Elliott Wave International. What is an Elliott Wave? And this is a very simple schematic. Well, it doesn't look so simple, but it's a schematic of what an Elliott Wave looks like. Uh, Elliott Wave, Elliott, uh, R.N. Elliott was an accountant back in the 30s, and he was looking at prices of stocks and prices of gold and prices of bonds and any freely traded market, and he noticed a similar pattern repeating through all these markets. And he said, you know what? I'm not just looking at a market of stocks or a market of interest rates or some gold bullion. I'm looking at something much more fundamental. There's a natural development to the way that people behave in crowds, and they get more optimistic in a pattern way, and they get more pessimistic in a pattern way. And these patterns are self-repeating at different degrees of scale. So at this big degree of scale with a one in a circle, you can see one, two, three, four, five. That's the basic pattern, five waves in the direction of the one larger trend. But if you break down this move right here, you can see itself subdivides into five waves because that's the direction of the one larger trend. And even if you look at this wave one here, it too subdivides into five waves. And in fact, if you get down, you can go down to a really a tick chart, a, a one second chart, and even that will trace out five waves in the direction of one larger trend. And once five waves are complete, you correct that trend in a three wave counter trend move, which, is, which we label ABC. Okay? Now notice this A wave breaks down into five waves. Why is that? 
because the one larger degree trend is down. Five ways in the direction of the one larger degree trend. And in this case, the trend is down, tracing on an ABC. And when this C wave gets done, usually near the area of the previous fourth wave, you go back into another five wave move to the upside. So that's the basic Elliott wave model. And what we do is we try to ascertain where we are within the development of the model, not so much because we know the future, but, it, but if you can determine where you are, it implies something about the future. For example, if you know you're here at the end of this A wave and you've just traced out five waves down, five waves unfold in the direction of one larger trend, so you're going to get a three-wave rally and then another five-wave decline. So it implies something, and that's how we make our forecast. So how do we apply this to the, to the U.S. stock market? Well, this is a chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average on a monthly basis from the 1932 low to the present. And you can see this basic five-wave model, and we've labeled it on this chart. Wave one, two, three, up into the 1966 high. Wave four in the 1974 low. And then we've been tracing out this five-wave rally ever since then. The fifth wave of this five-wave rally, wave five, started in March of 2009. That was the 2007 to 2009 bear market. And we published this chart in the most recent issue of our newsletter, the Elliott Wave Financial Forecast. And I want to call your attention to this dashed box here because what we're doing is we're blowing this move up, this last five wave move, because what we're trying to do is ascertain where we are within the development. That will tell us something about the future. And in our estimation, as we label these waves to the upside, we're in the fifth wave of the fifth wave of the fifth wave, this last rally wave. And this is something that uh, Bob Prechter identified back in his newsletter, The Elliott Wave Theorist, back in 2015. Uh, we had just had a big decline in the market. It was pretty sharp. And he said, you know, so far this channel that we've been, that the market's formed is held, and as long as it does, the Dow has an opportunity to rally. And that's what we've done from this low back in 2015. We rallied to a new high. Here's where we are, kind of updated came down from this high, so we've got one, two, three, four, and we're looking at this fifth wave here, this last rally wave. And it's important that we identify the subwaves because when we can identify the fifth of the fifth of the fifth, it implies that the market is done going up. So again, this is the model we're using, and we're trying to find out where we are. And that's kind of telling us in our stock market forecast what we should be expecting, okay? So let's zoom in on the Dow's rally. This is the Dow Industrial. This four is the February uh, 2016 low, February 11th, 2016. And what we're trying to do is count five. It's very simple, just kind of trying to count five waves up. We had a one and a two down into uh, June of 2016, and now we've rallied since that low, and I think we're near the end of this third wave, this little rally that we've had today is telling us that the last wave of this third wave is extending a little bit higher. Not done quite yet. It's probably going to last us maybe through the month, um, but sometime probably end of February, maybe early March, should be done with this third wave. And what does that tell us? Well, we're going in a fourth wave correction and then a final fifth wave to the upside. So that's kind of where we are with the development. It tells us that the, the bull market that's underway is not over quite yet but we're getting into the latter stages of it. And what we're trying to do now is we're trying to ascertain in terms of psychology, because that's what the market's reflecting. These waves are reflecting waves of psychology. They go from pessimism to optimism. So we're trying to look for ancillary signs to help either confirm or refute what we're seeing in the market. And one key sign that we look at is that the momentum of the rally. All right, we've had a pretty strong rally. It started on November 4th. Now, it's interesting how people label this the Trump rally, okay? But the election was on November 8th, okay? And the market started rallying <laughs> and in February of 2016. So what was happening during this whole period, okay? Well, Hillary Clinton was ahead in the polls, and everyone expected her to win. And in fact, on Friday, November 4th, is when the market made its low and started rallying. On November 7th, on Monday... What was happening in the election? All the people, all the polls were had, had Clinton winning, and the market was screaming to the upside. And on November 8th of the election, the election day, what, what happened up until maybe about 10 or 11 o'clock at night Eastern time? 
everyone had Hillary Clinton winning the polls. Well, it wasn't until around 11 or so that it became clear that Donald Trump was going to win the election. It finally occurred about, I think, uh, Fox and CNN headed around 2.30 in the morning, 2.40 in the morning. They called the election. Everyone is calling this the Trump rally, but the market actually had been rallying up on the news that Clinton was going to win, and it started rallying on that Monday when it appeared that all the polls had her winning. So I don't know how they attribute this to Donald Trump or how they attribute it to Hillary Clinton, but we don't look at that stuff because that stuff is irrelevant, and you can see how irrelevant it is here. Okay, what we're looking at is the patterns of psychology. Now, what, what this bottom chart shows, this bottom graph, is it's called a relative strength indicator. It's just a price momentum oscillator. How, what's the momentum of this rally? How strong it, is it? And that last leg pushed this price momentum oscillator to its high, sixth most highest level over the past 102 years, all the way back to 1914. Okay, that's a very strong rally leg. Stocks do not peak on peak momentum. They don't top on peak momentum. Usually what happens, you'll get peak momentum in the third wave, you'll have a fourth wave correction, and the fifth wave will go up, and it'll be a little bit weaker internally than the third wave. So this was kind of giving us confirmation that we're in a third wave, a third of the fifth. We're in the strongest portion. That strongest portion of the rally has now passed. It's over. Okay, so the rally should continue, but internally it should get weaker. And as long as we see signs that it's getting weaker, we're confident we're in a fifth wave. If we see strong signs, if we see signs that the rally is gaining momentum and then we go to an even greater momentum peak, well, then we know we have an indication in terms of our indicator. It's, it's not a fifth wave. It's probably an extension of our third wave. But right now, everything's on track is the way we see it. Now, this concept that I've been talking about every time I've come to these money shows is probably the single most important concept that we have in terms of ascertaining where we are. And that is extreme opinions shared widely constitute the single most reliable indicator of an impending change of direction for a market. So we're looking for signs of an extreme opinion that's shared widely. What's an extreme opinion? Well, we look at a, a, probably 100 different sentiment indicators. We're trying to ascertain the psychology. Are people optimistic? Are they pessimistic? Are they neutral? Because right? most of the time, they're kind of waffling in a neutral area. It's when they get to those extremes, whether it's a pessimistic extreme or an optimistic extreme, it usually is telling us we're near and we're in the latter stages of a rally. And something happened that was really interesting uh, just Wednesday. Uh, we got the latest investors intelligence advisors uh, poll of investment advisors. Were they bullish or were they bearish? Okay, and uh, the bullish percentage pushed to 69.9 percent. Okay, that's the highest level of optimism in 30 years. You have to go back to 1987, months before the crash of 1987, to find a level with higher optimism. Now, to see how this works, you just kind of look at where people are, look at where advisors are very pessimistic. It's usually after a market declines. This, is, this decline from October 2007 to March 2009 chopped 58% off the Dow Industrials. And look at how pessimistic advisors were at the low. And that's how advisors work. That's how all groups of investors work, from hedge funds to advisors to individuals. That is, they get more optimistic as the trend goes up, and they get more fearful and pessimistic as the trend goes down. And when they get fearful and pessimistic to an extreme, we know we're at a low. And when they get optimistic to an extreme, we know we're near a high. So this kind of gives us an indication and confirms we're in the final stages of this, of this five-wave rally because the optimism hasn't, is at levels that we haven't seen uh, for 30 years now. I mean, it's just unbelievably extreme. And, and this kind of excites us because we got to, okay, we, 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 this confirms what we're seeing. So we see that advisors are optimistic to extreme. Well, who else is optimistic? Well, another measure that we look at is the mutual fund cash to asset ratio. Mutual fund managers get all this money in, and are they putting it immediately in the market? Are they super confident that the market's going to go up, or are they fearful that it might go down? They're holding cash on the sidelines to meet redemptions and because they're worried that, you know, stocks are going to go down, people are going to sell their mutual funds. And again, we're, we're, we're at an all-time record low. What I've done is 
I've inverted the mutual fund cash to asset ratio to align it with the stock market. So as this line in the bottom goes up, that means that mutual fund managers are holding less and less cash. Okay? So as you can see, the cash level was at the time a record low 4% back in late 1972 and early 1973. It was right before the January 1973 peak in the market. And the market fell from January 73, the Dow bottomed in, in December of 1974, the S&P actually bottomed in October of 1974. But this decline here was 48% in the market. It may not look at there, but it was a huge decline. It was the biggest decline at the time since the Great Depression. Okay. Now, you heard the the phrase that the bull, a bull market climbs a wall of worry. Well, this is what a wall of worry looks like, okay? From 1982 all the way up to 2000, the market kept going higher and higher and making higher highs and higher lows and higher highs. It was a very strong advance, but look at the level of cash that mutual fund managers kind of held back because they were worried that the market was gonna enter a bear market again. Okay, 12, 10, 8% level. Well, finally, they capitulated to the bull market in 2000, all right? Uh, the mutual fund cash level returned to 4%, the same level it was in 1972, 1973. That was a top, and then the Dow and the S&P declined approximately 38%, 48% from that high. And they rallied back, and something interesting happened. Back in 2007, the mutual fund cash the asset ratio actually went to a new record, 3.5%. It broke that 4% level. The market topped in October 2007. The Dow declined 58% into 2009. What's so fascinating is the rally since 2009 has engendered such optimism from mutual fund managers. They don't believe that we're entering a bear market anytime soon. And in fact, uh, since September of 2009, the mutual fund cash to asset ratio has been below 4% uh, virtually every single month. There's one or two months it wasn't in there. So mutual fund managers are fully invested, and this is a, a high degree of optimism. And it, it, to us, it, it, it talks about the, the degree of the top that we're building here. Uh, something interesting happened in December, and that is the mutual fund cash to asset ratio went to an all-time record low 3%. So virtually all money that mutual fund managers have relative to, relative to their asset base is invested in the market. They simply do not believe that we're near a bear market. And again, this is a sign of extreme optimism. Another sign of extreme optimism is the, uh, vo the VIX, the CBOE Volatility Index, which uh, is at a low level, uh, under 10% under or right around right around 10, excuse me. What's interesting to us is that large speculators, or mainly hedge funds, uh, recently had a record uh, net short position on the VIX, okay? So in other words, they, they weren't betting that, the more, that volatility was gonna pick up. They were betting the volatility was gonna stay low. And usually when that happens, volatility upticks from there. Last time they had this was right here, right before this little correction here, which is about four to four and a half percent in the market. That's typical of a fourth wave. That's kind of what we're looking at going forward. Once this third wave ends, we should go into about a four to six to eight percent correction at the max, and then finally have that final wave to the upside. All right, so again, I want to get back to the basic model that we're looking at, which is this five wave move to the upside and how we apply it to the market. Now, something interesting has been happening to the Dow, okay? Because I showed you that five wave rally from the 1932 low. But if you look at the Dow and denominated, denominated anything other than dollars, you get a slightly different picture. And I've plotted this. We've plotted this in our newsletters. Um, on top is the Dow, we call it in current dollars and denominated in dollars. You can see that five-way pattern. But below is the Dow in constant dollars. To the left is the Dow deflated by the PPI. And to the right is Dow deflated by gold, gold being real money. And you can see that in terms of gold, the market topped out actually in 1999. And we've been in a true bear market in terms of real money since then. Now we've had a, a bounce back rally here, but in our estimation, this is a counter trend rally. So beneath the surface, all is not well. 
And again, this is kind of typical for, for, for a fifth wave where you're diverging relative to your third wave. If you notice, when the Dow was rallying from 1974 up to 2000, what was the Dow doing in, in terms of inflation adjusted or constant dollars? It was rallying too. In other words, everything was in sync. And that's kind of a third wave where everything's going up, you have the strong momentum. And then a fifth wave is when things start diverging. And we've seen we're kind of building this, this big, long top since 2000. Now, you could see it clearly in other things besides just the Dow in terms of real money. For example, if you look at kind of Asia on the upper left-hand corner, or the upper top panels, the upper left-hand corner is, is the Chinese stock market, the Shanghai Composite, that peaked out in 2007, made a lower high in 2015, and, we're, and this is where we are now. I mean, it's still lower than it is then. And kind of the same thing with the uh, MSCI Asia Pacific market, a top in 2007, a lower high in 2015, and it hasn't exceeded its high. In the middle, on the lower left, is the Eurostock 50 index. That's simply an index of the 50 biggest blue chip stocks in Europe. That actually peaked out in 2000, made a lower high in 2007, and made a lower high still after that. And then we have the World Stock Market Index, which peaked with the Dow in 2007, made a lower high in 2014. And then, of course, the Dow Gold that I showed you. And in the upper, in the, rather the lower right, is the Dow Industrials, denominated in dollars. So when we look at the market in terms of the headline numbers, everything looks great. We're rallying. You know, stocks are making new all-time highs. They made them today. But when you look around the world, you can start seeing these divergences. While everything was going up together until about 2000, 2007, and now we've kind of split apart. Again, consistent with a long topping processes and the latter stages of, of a bull market. Now, why is the U.S. stock market at new all-time highs and not some of these other markets? Well, one theory that we have, besides optimism is very high in the United States, is that people have been borrowing to buy stocks. Okay, and the top graph and the top line is the total margin debt. What people go buy when they buy stocks on margin, they borrow to buy the U.S. market. And you can see that we hit a high of actually 507 billion. That was an all-time record high that occurred in April of 2015. All right, and then margin debt pulled back when the market had a little bit of correction, but the Dow Industrials have gone to a higher high and margin debt hasn't quite kept up. And that divergence, I think, is important. You know, when, when people aren't enthusiastic to the degree they were, and they start pulling back a little bit, you can tell, you can tell that psychology is turning a little bit. And the bottom line is simply uh, the net cash people have available to invest in the market. It's margin debt minus free cash. And you can see, again, after a record high, we've pulled back and we haven't gone quite to a higher high. And even when we plot the market in terms of, say, its buying power, the productive capacity of the U.S., this is simply margin debt, that top line in the previous chart, and all we've done is divided by U.S. GDP to see kind of the production of what we have available to buy the market. Uh, and you've had this big spike in 2000, led to a bear market where the Dow lost 38% of its value. It came back and then had another big spike in 2007, went into a bear market where the Dow lost an even greater percentage, 58%. And now you had a big rally back and a spike into 2015. And again, as the Dow industrials went to a higher high in the S&P, margin debt, even as a percentage of U.S. GDP, hasn't kept track. So again, it's kind of confirming. We're looking at all these indicators. Are they lining up with what we think is going to happen, or are they refuting it and telling us we need to re-examine? And so far, everything we've seen kind of lines up to this big, long topping process. Again, we're not at the end of the rally, but we're very close to the end. Uh, I suspect it will be over sometime this year, and by the end of this year, we'll be well into the early stages of a long bear market. Uh, in percentage terms, you're probably going to see something like this, you know, where you get these big down moves in terms of the market relative to GDP, relative to optimism, relative to, to a lot of these other measures. So th again, this was about 38% decline. This is about a 58%. This next bear market is probably going to be bigger than this one here, uh, but we're not there quite yet. So let me just end the stock section with this little cartoon here because I think this kind of sums up 
what you read in the papers. On Wall Street today, news of lower interest rates sent the stock market up, but then the expectation that these rates would be inflationary sent the market down until the realization that lower rates might stimulate the sluggish economy, which pushed the market up. Before immediate, it ultimately went down in fears that an overheated economy will lead to reimposition of higher interest rates. In other words, there's always a rationalization on why the market goes up and down. And if you read the news headlines in the Wall Street Journal, you're watching the financial news networks like CNBC or Fox or Bloomberg, whatever, there's, they always point to some rationalization of why the market was doing what it's doing. But in, in, in truth, the only rationalization there is, the only reason it's going up is because optimism is increasing. And the reason it's going down is because pessimism is increasing. And if you can look to the, that model that we use that measures it, you can get a good kind of indication of where we are within the market. So I want to turn our attention now to interest rates, okay, because that's been in the forefront of a lot of the news of late. And we've had this huge interest rate cycle, which has really been fascinating. Uh, from a low in 1947, the commercial bank rate was 2.28%. The 10-year Treasury note in 1946 was 2.08%. And then we had this big move up in interest rates. What happened, we had this huge inflationary cycle. And rates peaked out in 1981 when the 30-year rate hit 15.21%. Uh, and then we went into this huge bull market in bonds. Okay, rates were coming down and prices were screaming to the point where we had an all-time record low in the 10-year treasury note of 1.36% 1.36% in July of last year. Big, big move in interest rates. And it's, you can see this entire cycle here. And it hasn't gone unnoticed from uh, investors. This is the number of bond funds in existence. And it's surged in tandem with investor interest in the bond market and in bonds. Why? Because we've been in a huge bull market. Okay, this is the number, it's tough to see, but this is the number of taxable bond mutual funds in existence. And as uh, earlier, as late as 2001, there was probably about 1,300 mutual funds that dealt with taxable bonds and invested in taxable bonds, and that has skyrocketed since then. What also has skyrocketed is the amount of assets in bond mutual funds. You can see that people were buying bond mutual funds. Why? Because bonds were in a huge bull market. Prices were rising, rates were going down, people were making money in the bond market. Assets rose six and a half times the size that they were in 1999, okay, for a bull market that lasted approximately 34 to 35 years. Well, something happened last year in 2016, and that is we saw this pattern, this Elliott Wave pattern that we recognize, and it's a special type of fifth wave. We showed the five wave rally, and we were counting five waves. You call this pattern an ending diagonal. You don't really have to know about it, other than the fact that we recognize it in real time. Pri bond prices, this is a 30-year T-bond futures, had come up to this trend line that dated back several years to 2012 and popped above it, which is kind of, it was a signal to us that we were at an exhaustion point, because that's kind of what happens at the end of this specific pattern. And we were looking for sentiment extremes, and we found it. Um, on the, the middle chart is large speculators. Those are trend followers, and th these, they buy and sell bond futures and options. And the large speculators are mainly hedge funds, money managers. And again, when the trend goes up, they tend to buy with it. And when the trend goes down, they tend to sell. On the bottom is commercial insiders. And, this, and what, what interests us and what we did when we published this chart originally in July was we were interested in the spread between the two because it had hit a 21-year extreme that the hedge funds are super excited on bonds and the insiders were selling it. Uh, and that was an extreme. And tell us we're kind of at the end of this move. So uh, we, we forecasted, a, a, we said actually in our newsletter, this was the July 2016 issue of the Elliott Wave Financial Forecast, which I write with my partner, Pete Kendall. Uh, we, we actually are in print saying a trend reversal is nigh. And the reason we said it is because we're looking at this pattern that was coming to an end. Uh, Bob Prechter recognized this in the Elliott Wave theorists and actually published it too. And what happened? Well, bond prices peaked out. We came back below that upper trend line, which told us that this move was over. Uh, bond 
prices fell about 15 points, the yield on the 10-year uh, Treasury note doubled. It went from 1.36 or 1.32 percent at the low up to 2.64 percent. It's gone a little bit higher uh, since then. Uh, but but it tells us that the bond move was over. And look what happened at the top. We had a 21-year record net long position from these hedge funds. They were buying like crazy right at the high, and then they completely reversed their position. Okay, so we've come down 15 points. We got to this little support level, and I'm going to focus in right here on this move right here. Okay, starting at that low, this is the 10-year Treasury note. Okay, we published in this in our newsletter. Uh, couple weeks ago, uh, and since then, the price has actually shot up to a, a new high above the A-way high. But what do you notice in this rally here? It traces out that five-wave pattern. Now, this is a 120-minute chart. Remember I said that these, these waves unfold at all degrees of trend, from monthly, yearly, all the way down to tick charts? Well, even on a 120-minute chart, we can see this five-wave move. The five waves are going in which direction? They were going up which tells us the one larger trend is up. And so after a three-wave pullback, we were forecasting another five-wave rally that was going to push above that. We've since done that. Now, this fifth wave is not quite over. Uh, I think it probably has got another point or two to go. Uh, but this is an ABC rally. This is a counter-trend move, OK? So what this tells us is that starting from this five, this was the end of a very, very long bull market in bond prices a bull market in yields. And now we've reversed that trend, and it's not over. So interest rates are rising, and prices are going down. Okay? Interest rates move inversely to prices. Okay? We looked at a another big bond rally that a lot of people uh, haven't really examined that, quick, that closely, but we did. And this is the bond market rally from 1900 that peaked in 1920. Okay, and then reversed trend from there. This is interest rates that we're plotting. Um, and I think we're right about here, somewhere in here, in terms of this entire move. And I think we're getting, gonna get a spike up in interest rates as we go into a, a debt deflation. Now, wh why would I say a debt deflation? Well, the reason being is because if you look at the amount of total dollar-denominated debt, we're at an all-time high, all right? All the, the reasons why we went into that big bear market of 2007, 2009 haven't been corrected at all. I mean, we had all this debt we've been piling on. At the time, it was a lot of mortgage debt, and there is a lot of mortgage debt out there right now that the Fed has basically taken over the paper. The Fed is about three quarters of the mor mortgage market right now. But we haven't corrected any of this in any event. Okay? We just keep piling on more and more debt, and at some point, it gets too big for the economy and for the investors to handle. And when debt starts to contract relative to available goods and services, that's a deflationary environment. In fact, if you look at total credit market debt as a percentage of US GDP, we're still at the levels that we were back in 1999 when the Dow, in terms of real money, gold, started its bear market. Okay, so we've had this big credit boom. We really, I mean, this is this this dash line is kind of whoops is kind of the long-term average. I think that's eventually where we're going. We haven't really started down that path yet. So that's why I think there's a deeper deflation coming in the future. Uh, in terms of what the Fed did, I mean, the Fed really just follows the market. The Fed doesn't set the market. The Fed is simply a component of the market. It's subject to the whims of optimism and pessimism like everyone else. When we went into the huge bear market, the Fed started expanding their balance sheet, but that, you know, that didn't stop the bear market. I mean, stock prices still went down 58%. Um, they bet they're standing at 4.5 trillion now. Uh, at some point, they're gonna, have to they're gonna have to shrink their balance sheet, and that's also another kind of deflationary environment where they're putting a lot more debt back in the market, in a market that can't handle it. So. In response to the crisis of 2007, 2009, we all know the Fed dropped their interest rates to, to effectively zero. Uh, China's been dropping their interest rates ever since then. The European Central Bank remains at a zero interest rate. Bank of England is essentially zero. Now, the Fed has ticked up their interest rate a little bit, um, but you know, essentially it's at, at a, a multi-decade, multi-year low. Uh, from when they started dropping in 2008 when it was at 6.5%. They're still around 1%, a little bit less than 
And in fact, if you look at central banks around the world, you would think that after the 2007-2009 crisis, when supposedly things were all better, that rates would have been rising, anticipation of an expanding economy. But actually, what's happening is things are getting worse to the point where uh, central banks are now issuing negative yielding debt. Think about that for a second. <laughs> they're issuing debt. They're, you actually have to pay central banks in Europe to borrow money. And that's insane. They're not paying you an interest rate. You're actually giving them $100, and when that bond matures, you're only getting back $90 or whatever, 95, 95 cents on the dollar. There's more than, tw actually, almost $12 trillion of negative yielding debt in the world right now, which um, it is, shows you the depths of problems we have within, within the economy, within the worldwide economy. Because in a healthy economy, you don't have negative yielding debt. You have positive yielding debt. You, you're, you're lending your money to the government, and in return, they're giving you an interest. But if you look at, say, two of the most stout credit in the world right now, Germany, Germany, which is probably the strongest economy in Europe, in Switzerland, they still have negative yielding debt. This is a five-year government-issued bonds. Okay, so you're guaranteed to lose money if you buy these safest bonds. The way we termed it in our newsletter, you're you're going to lose your money safely. All right, it's gotten to such a negative point in Japan that there's actually a run on safes. On, uh, on safes in Japan, people are going out and they're buying safes and they're taking the money they have and instead of giving it to the bank where they're going to lose money on it, they're just putting it in the safe. And I think eventually, eventually that's going to spread to Europe and it's going to spread over across the pond to the shores of the United States too. So if you want to beat the crowd, buy a safe. Um, now what's interesting to us is that despite basically zero interest rates, we have no inflation. In fact, we, we've had a historic fiscal and monetary stimulus. This is the Fed's favorite way of measuring inflation, deflation. It's inflation and deflation. It's, been, it's kind of been bumping along the bottom here. And what's fascinating to us is despite the Fed's best efforts and the U.S. government's best efforts to expand the economy, at the end of 2016, just a couple of months ago, we had a record 11th year in a row of sub-3% growth. We've never had that in the history of the United States, where we've gone 11 straight years of sub-3% growth. Why have we had sub-3%? We would contend is because we've built up this massive amount of debt, and, and it's weighing on our productive ability to, to, to service it. We don't have the wherewithal. We're not generating the income to service it, and it's weighing down our growth. All right, and we don't see, I mean, the only way out of this debt is for the debt to either be defaulted upon or restructured or retired, and that's very deflationary. So central bank lending and government borrowing are failing to generate economic growth. That's very, very troublesome for the worldwide economies. And what's also very troublesome here is that we're starting to see an uptick in global corporate default rates. Okay, this is through mid-2016, I don't have the latest update, but you can see that, that global de corporate default rates are starting to uptick here. This is uh, the big 2009 credit crisis, and we have global default rates that are the highest since then. Right? And this is supposedly with an economy that's expanding and the U.S. stock market in a bull market. What happens if the U.S. Stock, mar stock market completes its fifth wave and reverses trend? Or what happens if the, gov or, or if the economy, which is growing sub-3% right now, starts to get weaker? And you can see that there, the seeds of a potential impending problem are out there. We think it's deflationary. Uh, deflation is simply defined as a contraction in the volume of money and credit relative to available goods and services. Right? And when that debt starts being restructured or paid off or defaulted upon, you're going to have a debt deflation. And that's going to be very bearish, we think, throughout the economy. Now, in terms of gold, how does gold factor into this? Well, gold simply traces out the same patterns that any other freely traded market. Gold doesn't have any other special properties. You know, people say, well, there's only so much gold in the world. But it's not about supply and demand, it's about psychology. 
So again, here's this model, five waves in the direction of one larger trend. When you complete five up, what do you do? You go into an ABC, the A subdivides into a five, the C subdivides into a five, that all completes the correction. So here we are with gold from the top in 2011 when it was at 1921.50. Okay, we published this chart in our newsletter on November 6th of 2015. Okay, well over a year ago, and what we, what we were doing, well, we were following this five-wave decline in the price of gold, okay? And that tells us that the one larger trend is down, okay? And in fact, at the low, we came down, we met this trend line. We published this in our newsletter on December 4th, a day from the low, and we titled the chart, Sharp Rally is Imminent. Okay, we were looking for gold to rally after it hit a low, around $1,000, a little bit more than that. It hit 1046.20 on December 3rd. So the day after the low is when we came out with our newsletter and we said sharp rally is imminent. And again, what are we doing? We're looking for extreme opinions. Was there anything to back that up, to confirm what we're seeing in the Elliott Wave pattern? And yes, there was. We were looking again at, at uh, these cohort of traders, large speculators, commercial insiders. What were they doing? Well, com well, the large speculators were selling futures and options contracts. Why? Because gold was down over 40% from its high in 2011. They were so certain that the price of gold was going to continue to go down that they were selling into the market and betting. And you can see that as the commercials were buying, the hedge funds were selling, and it was at a similar point to where we were in these little rallies here. But our, our view at the time was that this rally is going to be bigger than these other rallies, and the simple reason was because we were at the end of this five-wave move. And, uh, in fact, gold popped up. Uh, it, wave A down erased 45%, uh, and you went from 1046 up to 1375. So the market did exactly what we expected. Uh, and large speculators went from selling to buying. In fact, they were record net long at this high right here. And so that tells us that the counter trend rally was ending. In fact, this is what gold looks like relative to its schematic. And this is kind of updated. So you've got that five wave rally, and then you've had wave A. We think we're somewhere right around here within this counter trend rally. We don't think this B wave's over quite yet. Probably we're going to pop up again in gold to complete the B wave. Um, and in fact, we published this uh, in December of 2016, so two months ago, where we had a record degree of pessimism in terms of traders, and we thought gold would start to rally again. And we think that rally is beginning right here. In fact, gold's popped up here. Probably going to take out this high here at 1375, get into this range right here. Uh, if you read our newsletter, we published this a couple weeks ago, and since then, gold's popped up even higher. Now, people are starting to get a little bit more bullish on it, but we're not at the extremes quite yet that would suggest that the rally is over. So we're in this ABC rally. Uh, B wave is probably going to carry us here, and then gold's going to roll over, go back down, and make lower lows to complete the ABC decline. Probably get below $1,000 an ounce on it. Uh, so that's kind of what we're looking at. If you're interested in gold, you can read our newsletter because we're been pretty good in forecasting the twists and turns of what's happening. Let me just get to the U.S. dollar here because that's been in the news. And again, I want to take you back to what we're looking at in terms of the dollar. Extreme opinions shared widely. We're looking for extreme opinions. Let's go back to 2007, late 2007. What was happening? Well, <laughs> interesting enough, Supermodel Giselle Bunchin, otherwise known as Mrs. Tom Brady, my favorite quarterback as a New England Patriot fan, was, was so certain that the dollar, which had been declining since 2001, was going to continue to go down, that she wanted to be paid in anything but dollars. Okay? Now, this was a sentiment, sentiment extreme to us. Why? Because when a supermodel is so conscious of what a market is doing, you're probably at the end of the move. Okay? I love Giselle Bunchen because I love Tom Brady. So um, that was right here when she wanted to be paid only in anything but other than dollars. The market went down until a few more months. That was November of 2007. The market went down into March of 2008. So about four or five more months. It bottomed, and the dollar started a huge rally since then. Um, 
So she was telling us no dollars right there. Dollars made a low. We were forecasting at LMA International a huge rally in the dollar. In fact, we had that initial wave of it, which traced out five waves to the upside. And then we had this big ABC decline. And right near the low of this C wave, we got another sentiment signal that the dollar was about to rally. And that was we started seeing books coming out. And this one was called Crashing the Dollar. When Ben Bernanke was chairman, they had uh, former President Barack Obama. If you notice there's a dollar bill folded up as an airplane crashing with fire coming out of it. And so we said, well, you know what? That's, you know, and we were looking at other sentiment indicators, but this was helping us confirm we're probably ready for a dollar to rally. Uh, this came out in October th 2010. The dollar bar bottomed shortly thereafter, and we went on this huge rally to the upside. One, two, three, went into a little fourth wave correction. And what did we see recently in terms of the dollar that might indicate we're at a high or very close to it? Well, we saw a magazine cover. And instead of the crashing dollar, what did we have? We had the mighty dollar, where the economist had a picture of George Washington all bulked up. Okay? So we published this chart, last call for the dollar. We think the fifth wave is either over or it might have one more new high to complete a five-wave rally in the dollar starting from the 2010 low. Again, we see that same basic Elliott wave pattern, one, two, three, four, five to the upside. This is the model that we use and tells us about, gives us an idea of what's going to be happening in various markets. So it's fulfilled our forecast. We thought it would make a new high. In fact, the dollar made a 15-year high, 14-year high uh, right here uh, earlier, earlier last year. Um, that could be it. We could have one more little pullback and a rally up, but, but in any event, we're very, very late in the U.S. dollar index and the U.S. dollar rally. So uh, you probably are going to be looking to sell dollars in the coming months as the dollar goes lower and lower and lower. So uh, we think gold is in a counter trend rally. It's probably not over. The dollar either is over or might have one little final push up. The U.S. stock market is in the late stages of, of fifth wave, probably is going to go into a fourth wave correction late this month, maybe in March, maybe bottom sometime April, May, and have a final rally up to complete its five-wave pattern, and everything rolls over to the downside. So that's kind of our overview at Elliott Wave International. Um, if you're interested at all in what we had to say, or if you're interested in reading our forecasts or our newsletters, some of the indicators we look at, the psychology, just go to this URL, ElliottWave.com, two L's, two T's. And we have tons of free stuff on the website. Uh, we have articles and interviews. Uh, we have a new thing called Elliott Wave TV, uh, where we have a lot of uh, interviews online with uh, various analysts that we have at the firm. It's really interesting. You can get to it through our website, ElliottWave.com, and a lot of neat things going on. And if you want to check out my newsletter or Bob Prechter's newsletter, you can get it right here. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank yeah. you.